Um, today's um, message is about, again, about uh, Holy Spirit. We've been learning the work of the Holy Spirit um, since the um, Pentecost Sunday for several weeks. And as you see at the front wall, we sort of been waiting, uh, been hoping to be led and guided by the Spirit of the Lord to come and fill us so that we might live the God-given full life and also our lives might demonstrate the love of Christ to those around us. And I believe it's been one of our top prayer, po prayer points as a church following our vision, Revive, Restore, Reach Out, and especially on Wednesday and Thursday evening prayer times, as well as our church council meetings. We have been praying for that God-given vision to come true in our congregation. So I'd like to encourage all of us to encourage and to, to uphold one another in prayer so that all of, all of us can witness the renewing work of the Holy Spirit and of the Lord in our congregation because God is good and God is faithful. Amen. So last week we talked about how the Spirit of the Lord blesses us when he works in our lives. We reflected on the David Psalm 19 as an example of it. So in a very short summary, there were three blessings that we learned with regard to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Number one, the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see the beauty of the creation as a gift from the Father God by renewing our personal relationship with him. So we feel the hands and the heart of God for us when we're watching the creation around, around us. From the air we breathe to the little unknown flower in the field, and from the land we stand on to the stars in the sky. The Holy Spirit keeps reminding us that everything is for you and me, the humans who are created in God's image, to enjoy and to participate in the wonders and the fullness of life in him. So I wonder if you have had a chance to feel that the beauty of creation during the week. For me, every day, in the um, almost at sunset time, the sky is so beautiful. So whenever I see that um, sunset during the day, these days, it's so amazing. So what sort of things that you experience that, you know, in terms of creation, the beauty of God in your life? Anyone? In your backyard or <laughs> the air, <laughs> coldness, Steve? Birds. Birds, yes, of course. Anyone else? Grass, of course, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are many, many parts of things that we can enjoy and give thanks to God for the creation around the world. And number two, second blessing was the Holy Spirit draws us closer to the Word of God, encouraging us to find strength and comfort by reading and meditating on his living word. Romans chapter 8. Um, yes, it says, And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. So when we have a deep desire for strength, guidance, or direction in our lives, the Holy Spirit opens our ears to listen to the Word of God, written or spoken, which we sometimes have not paid much attention to because of various commitments, busy life, or lack of interest, or whatever. As Paul says, since the Spirit of the Lord knows what we really need for our souls and God, what God wants us to pray for, he draws us closer to God who speaks through his word. So when you sense a gentle nudge of Holy Spirit leading you to read, listen, or watch any forms of message or word, you get to know that what the Lord is working in your life. 
to reveal his plan for you. So don't ignore his leading and make a time to meditate on the word of God. Maybe start with five minutes a day. It's reflection time. And increase like 10 minutes, half an hour, one hour. Number three, the blessings. The Holy Spirit empowers us to be more sensitive to sin and to any influences and temptations which might affect the personal relationship with the Lord by giving us courage to stand in the truth, to do things in the light, and to choose what belongs to the Lord. There are the three blessings we talked about last week. Today's lectionary reading, which Barbara read for us, is related to the third blessing, blessing just mentioned. This Galatians reading, I believe, will help us to go deeper into the work of the Holy Spirit and to know more about the profound grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is one of the famous topics of all time, which is law versus grace, or law and grace. Let's read um, verses 16 to 18 of today's passage. It says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When we follow our sinful nature, we become slaves of sin. When we feel the grace of God doesn't seem to be close to us, or when we are not sure of the Spirit's leading and guidance in our lives, we begin to rely on our own judgments or other means which may not necessarily come from the Lord. Unfortunately, as the passage says, our sinful nature often tempts us to pursue self-satisfaction by keeping the law, by keeping the law. When I say keeping the law, it means all our efforts in trying to follow or fulfill what people believe to be good, appropriate, ethical, or moral, including the self-focused interpretations on the word of God. When that happens, what we experience is we begin to see ourselves trying to appease our own sort of policemen representing the law in our hearts. Like this. <laughs> when he is around, and the policeman is around, we try to live a seemingly righteous life. And we are a law-abiding good citizens. But when we get a chance to escape from his presence, we want to do whatever has been suppressed by the policeman's surveillance in our hearts. The human desires, which Paul is talking about. When it is expressed, when the sinful nature comes to the fore, it goes opposite to what the Holy Spirit wants. Paul says, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. If the policeman, the law in our hearts, finds any of those results, he would give us a sense of guilt and shame and will try to demand us to make up for it. Good deeds, good works, and hard work. That's what he would demand. It is all about doing. And it won't give us rest. And it won't tell us much about why we should do, do those things. But will keep demanding us to be a good person or a good Christian or a good church when only God is good. 
This is what the law does. The book of Romans is all about this seemingly unsolvable dilemma people face, especially in their faith journey. I wonder if you have ever experienced this in your life. This cycle between grace moments and confronting the legalistic self, between law and grace. And how have you handled those moments? And what have you learned? I believe freedom comes when you don't feel obliged, constrained, or burdened. A freed person has energy. A freed person effuses joy. A freed person enjoys moments, even in solitude. A freed person shows freedom to others. And a freed person does work for the sake of freedom. So freedom revives, freedom restores, and freedom empowers. This following passage is a good example of how freedom is expressed in our Christian context. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people, to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Amen. As you see, Paul says, that he can be like or live like a slave who serves his master. Or be like a Jew living under the Jewish law. Or like the Gentiles who don't care about the Jewish law but who follows their own desires. But he says he is not subject to any of what they are obliged to or what may constrain their thoughts or movements. Even though he physically lives in their culture, custom, or the rules, his heart and mind won't be affected by them because he is a freed man under the grace of God. In other words, the law he used to follow didn't give him true freedom no matter how thoroughly and extensively he observed it, but actually gave him more burden, more requirements, with no rest. But he now says, he is free from those laws demand while still living in the same culture with the same people and of the same Jewish law. And all his heart and efforts were on keeping the law and following whatever it required him to do. But now his focus is elsewhere. 1 Peter chapter 2 says, Once you were, you were like sheep who wandered away, But now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. So Paul's wandering self found the true shepherd, the guardian of his soul. The law constantly gave him a hard time because of his merciless, uncompassionate, apathetic nature. But it actually led him to yearn for true freedom, true joy, and true life. Because of the Lord's requirements he tried to fulfill, he reached the point where he realized that he would never be able to find life in it, joy in it, and freedom in it. So he was once stuck in that dilemma, completely stuck in that dilemma. 
the more he wants to fulfill the demands of the law, the more he feels distant from God. The more he tries to be a better believer, the more he loses his strength and confidence in himself. But when the grace of God came into his life, the policeman, the law, lost its power and its sting and gradually disappeared. When the true freedom in Jesus filled his heart, the feeling of guilt and shame the law constantly projected on him turned into thanks, praises, and victory. Let's listen to him again, Romans chapter 7. It says, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. The power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God, the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. So you see, what he is confessing is that I'm a completely miserable person when I, myself, try to fulfill the Lord's demand. But when I'm in Christ Jesus, my Lord and my Savior, I am free from sin. I no longer need to rely on my endless efforts to be righteous, to look good, to feel good about myself, because Jesus Christ has already done, accomplished all those things for me. Thank God. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. His confession is just amazing. I sometimes follow what my sinful nature did once. I have bad thoughts going on in my mind. I speak in inappropriate languages occasionally. I feel I'm not good enough. I'm not faithful enough. So what? So what? It is no longer the policeman in me who condemns me and punishes me. But Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, who is united with me, who is never separated from me, forgives, accepts, and loves me unconditionally, no strings attached. The king, the judge, has declared your sins are forgiven because he loves you and because you belong to him. And no one, nobody, no life issues, no viruses, no mental health issues, no relationship challenges, if my own thoughts, nothing in the world will be able to revoke or reverse that eternal verdict. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 8, it says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can, body, can somebody say amen in a loud voice? <laughs> Can someone say a big hand to our Lord Jesus Christ? Let's give a big hand to our Lord Jesus Christ. Complete freedom. Complete freedom in Christ Jesus because he has done on the cross, because he has done in the grave. We are freed no matter what is going on, no matter what thoughts are going on, 
no matter what the circumstances around us, the verdict, you are forgiven, you are accepted, you are loved, will last forever. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that beautiful? All right. I just <laughs> prepared this little demonstration for not only for the kids, but also everyone. I think it shows you the message that I've just spoken to you. So let's just have a look at this. What I'm trying to demonstrate is when God created us, we were like this, translucent, very clear, bold, with words like this, very clear, which means we can see through this bold, with words like this. We were able to communicate with God with no obstacles, with no things or war, anything. We were like that. We were created, created like that. Enjoyed everything, participated in everything. But when the sinful nature comes in, it was like this. We were not able to really communicate with God because of things happened in our lives. Like Paul said, he feels really miserable when he was living in that situation. He was completely stuck. He didn't know what to do because on his own, on his strength, with his wisdom, he can't do anything about this. As we reflected, when grace, when his grace comes in, into our lives, Again and again. His living grace, when it comes into our lives, when His living word fills our hearts, the ones blocked and blank hearts changed into the original mind which God has intended for us to have. I believe this is the grace of God. The living water, the river of grace that we have in our hearts, the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit never ends. He cleanses us every time so that we can always have a good relationship with our Father God, the Creator God. Can I pour some more? <laughs> like this. Amen to that? can only pray and give thanks to our God for his wonderful, profound mercy and 